good morning. Good morning and good afternoon. Case 14 in the Blue Cliff Record, Yun Men's appropriate response. Among past Yun Men, what are the teachings of a whole lifetime? Yun Men said, an appropriate response. And I was having a conversation with someone about this case recently, and sometimes a question just arrives that you've never asked before, and it just arrives, and it's an interesting question. And I asked, if one gave an appropriate response, every moment of one's life, would one be an awakened Buddha? And I think the answer is that yes. If one gave an appropriate response, moment by moment, one would be an awakened Buddha. So today at uh, four o'clock, Sunday, February the 20th, 2022, we are having a Jukai ceremony here in Twining Vine Zen Center for Alex and Navanwi. And uh, in California, that will be 9 p.m. on Tuesday, uh, Saturday, 9 p.m. Saturday. Um, and the Jukai ceremony, receiving the precepts, you could say it is a skill and it is actually a, an appropriate response in itself. It's an appropriate response. There's also a skillful way to contemplate what is an appropriate response. And the monk asked, what is the Buddha's teaching of a whole lifetime? Like of a whole lifetime. And you may said an appropriate response. So this is a this is a practice of a whole lifetime. And so this this um, Jukai ceremony this afternoon is uh, a Diamond Sangha teacher from Adelaide, Alan Merritt, will be giving the precepts to Alex and Mavanwi. And because of COVID, he's not able to come across from Adelaide. So we're going to do it here in the Zendo in a sort of a hybrid form. And, and I'll stand in as his body. But he will do the ceremony. And uh, the ceremony involves receiving the three refuges, refuges, refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the three pure precepts, uh, as to practice right conduct, or to sometimes to uphold the forms and ceremonies, but to practice right conduct, to do all good, to save all beings, and then the 10 grave precepts. Taking up the way not to kill, not to lie, to not misuse sexuality, to not steal or take what is not given, to not speak of the faults of others, to not praise oneself at the expense of others, to not indulge in anger, to not intoxicate body and mind of self or other, um, to not um, be stingy with the Dharma assets, and to not defame the three treasures. Three treasures. So, um, Although they do sound a little bit like prohibitions, that really would be um, a 
a very sort of an atrophied view of them to see them just as prohibitions because the difficulty of, with seeing things as prohibitions is that it embedded in that is a bit of an assumption that you would want to do these things and so you have to prohibit yourself you know like the laws that we've had you know over time prohibiting things because there's a sense that if you made it available people would do it and that's not really our way our way is more the way of that our true nature wants to do good and wants to be wholesome and it's only the slings and arrows of life that cause us to be deluded in certain ways that we therefore then actually do accidentally, so to speak, really, when it comes down to it, accidentally make the error of being unwholesome. So they're not prohibitions. And um, in the book Being Upright by Rev Anderson, there's a quote that I like about this. about the precepts. Even though they read like prohibitions, the 10 grade precepts are not given to prevent us from acting in unwholesome ways, but rather are meant to awaken us from delusion. So I, wonder, I was wondering how would the 10 grade precepts, just knowing them, how does that awaken us from delusion. And, and maybe one way would be when you take each one and then really contemplate it and consider it closely, you see how true it is, how beneficial it is, you know, how like not to kill. What does that mean, not to kill? If we slowly um, and openly really contemplate uh, the 10 grade precepts, it, the effect is that it will crack open our heart. And then we just won't want to do those. We just don't want to kill. And we'll be sad every time we accidentally do. And if we contemplate them deep, deeply, we'll also see the subtle other side of them. That there is uh, the unconditioned which cannot be killed. There's the unconditioned which cannot be tainted in any way. And that, um, that brings a lot of peace, a lot of peace of mind. And helps us be helps us be stable. And another way of thinking about what mistaken views are that lead to unwholesome actions is um, the mis you could say the sort of core mistaken views are um, thoughts like me and mine, them and theirs, us and them. That's the core mistaken view, is to think that things exist as separate entities and in, that's the mistaken view and then amplified by and in polarity to each other and in conflict or contrast to each other. rather than seeing that these are just uh, appearances. These are appearances. And I was, I was listening to a talk the other day about karma and uh, by my teacher, oh, maybe it wasn't by Kokyo. I was listening to a Dharma talk uh, and they were discussing karma and how it's translated as action. And then they were saying that when you look closely, what, what drives action is 
the mental formations, is, is the thinking, the mental habits, the emotional states, you know, any number of words that we could use that drives the action. And so contemplating what is an appropriate response, contemplating the three pure precepts, the three refuges, the 10 grade precepts, helps purify our mind, uh, purify our thoughts. So then, so then we naturally want to respond to the world openly and compassionately. And, and the reason we say we naturally want to, even though it doesn't look natural because we've been doing zazen and we've been studying and so on, it looks like we've been making an effort, but it's natural in that that the effort that we're making is to um, just discard the delusion. We're not making an effort to make something, we're just discarding delusion. So that then we can naturally, it's like the natural uh, Buddha nature just wants to, to do that, but it's hindered by the habits, the mental habits, it's hindered by them. So our practice helps us you know, remove the hindrances or let the hindrances dissolve. So then we can naturally uphold the precepts. And um, I thought it would be kind of interesting to read a few old stories about appropriate responses. This is a, an old book called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones by, by Paul Reps. There's an artwork of his at Green Gulch, Zen, uh, Green Gulch Monastery. So this story is called Publishing the Sutras. Tetsugen, a devotee of Zen in Japan, decided to publish the sutras, which at that time were available only in Chinese. The blocks were to be printed with wood block, the books were to be printed with wood blocks in an edition of 7,000 copies, a tremendous undertaking. So of course that meant that the wood blocks had to each be carved with all the characters of of these sutras, I mean, an enormous undertaking. Tetsugen began by traveling and collecting donations for this purpose. A few sympathizers would give him a hundred pieces of gold, but most of the time he received only small coins. He thanked each donor with equal gratitude. After 10 years, Tetsugen had enough money to begin his task. It happened that at that time, the Yuji River overflowed. Famine followed. Tetsugen took the funds he had collected for the books and spent them to, to save others from starvation. Then he began his work of collecting again. Several years afterwards, an epidemic sped, spread through the country. Tetsugen again gave away what he had collected to help his people. For a third time he started his work, and after 20 years his wish was fulfilled. The printing blocks were produced. The first edition of sutras can be seen today at Obaku Monastery in Kyoto. The Japanese tell their children that Tetsugen made three sets of sutras, and that the first two invisible sets surpass even the last. Isn't that a moving story? Makes me feel like crying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because what he did was no, I'm going to cry what he did was he responded appropriately he responded appropriately he had this wish to do the to make this set of sutras which was a wonderful aspiration and yet when conditions arose in front of him it called him to do something differently. In that moment, he could pivot from his original aspiration and instead let it go. Even though it was a wonderful aspiration, he could let it go because there was something immediate 
it was calling for him to do instead. And he gave away the money. And then he did it again a second time. That takes a lot of, uh, a lot of, I guess, a lot of compassion <laughs> and a lot of selflessness, you know, a lot of selflessness, a lot of letting go of an idea. And I see it, my sense is that he didn't have to let go very much but because his practice was deep. Uh, it wasn't like he had to follow a precept. He just responded appropriately. And that's that's how we want to see the precepts, not that some we can use them to try and train ourselves like to like we can we can use them a little bit like prohibitions, a little reminder like, ah, I feel like gossiping. I'm not going to. I mean, we can use them that way. Um, but then after a while, we'll just not want to. And that's really beautiful when it just flows like that. So that's one story of an appropriate response. Here's another one that's quite different. This one's called The Blockhead Lord. Two Zen teachers, Daigu and Gudo, were invited to visit a Lord. Upon arriving, Gudo said to the Lord, you are wise by nature and have an inborn ability to learn Zen. Nonsense, said Daigu. Why do you flatter this blockhead? He may be a lord, but he doesn't know anything of Zen. So instead of building a temple for Gudo, the lord built it for Daigu and studied Zen with him. So in case you had little trouble following the names, the lord ended up recognizing that the the Zen teacher that called him a blockhead was actually the teacher he needed. So he wasn't that much of a blockhead. <laughs> or maybe, and this, this kind of connects to what we were talking about last week about um, the eight consciousnesses. In each moment, we can plant a seed that turn someone's storehouse consciousness in we plant we can help plant a seed for them so maybe what actually happened in that moment is when daigu said nonsense i'm not going to just flatter this lord just because he's a lord i'm going to say it like it is in that moment maybe the lord changed from being a blockhead <laughs> to like hey I think I don't want to be a blockhead anymore. I want to, I want to be open-minded, not closed-minded. So I included this story because it's a truth-telling story. But truth-telling stories, truth-telling <clears throat> sometimes is risky. Here it worked. Here's a truth-telling story that worked. If someone just told a difficult truth and it was a benefit. But sometimes telling, a, telling the truth is not always the best thing to do. And I'm remembering uh, Kenshin Roshi in a Dharma talks speaking about truth telling. And I can't remember if these were quite with the four cautions he gave, but these are the four that I seem to now have inherited in my mind with truth telling. Firstly, is it true? <clears throat> is it true? Is it timely? Is it beneficial to tell? And do I have the skills to do it? <laughs> I think this is very important. Do I have the skills to do it? There have been times when I've been tempted to want to say a hard truth to someone, and then I've just intuited, I don't think I have the skills to do it successfully. You know, it might be true, it might be timely, it could well be beneficial, but I'm not the one to do it. <laughs> yeah. So you know, telling the truth is not always that straightforward. So I included that story just as a way to sort of consider that it's, we need to contemplate closely what, what, uh, 
what not lying or what telling the truth is. And this last story. This last story is called A Buddha. In Tokyo, in the Meiji era, there lived two prominent teachers of opposite characteristics. One, Unsho, an instructor in Shungon, kept Buddha's precepts scrupulously. He never drank intoxicants, nor did he eat after 11 o'clock in the morning. The other teacher, Tanzan, a professor of philosophy at the Imperial University, never observed the precepts. When he felt like eating, he ate, and when he felt like sleeping in the daytime, he slept. One day, Unsho invited Tanzan, who was drinking wine at the time, visited Tanzan, who was drinking wine at the time, not even a drop of which was supposed to touch the tongue of a Buddhist. Hello, brother, Tanzan greeted him. Won't you have a drink? I never drink, exclaimed Unsho solemnly. One who does not drink is not even human, said Tanzan. Do you mean to call me inhuman just because I do not indulge in intoxicating liquid, liquid, liquids, exclaimed Unsho in anger? Then if I am not human, what am I? And Tanzan said, a Buddha. <laughs> So I included this story, I think it's fairly, fairly evident why that we want to be very careful not to be rigid with the precepts, that they are, that, that, that they are not fixed, that each of us needs to find our own way. And each of us has a personality and our personalities are different and we can express the precepts differently. I mean, it says here that Tanzen didn't uh, follow the precepts, but one could maybe say he followed them in a different way. He followed them in a way that wasn't, um, wasn't the way they are usually followed, but maybe he followed them in the way of uh, responding appropriately to his conditions. Maybe it was really quite appropriate for him to do it that way. I don't do it that way. But what's good is to be able to say, I, 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 don't, um, I don't drink alcohol, but then not to say, and so you shouldn't drink alcohol. <laughs> that's, not our, that's not really our business to do that, really. So um, just that earlier point, I want to emphasize again that we're practicing so that we joyfully uphold the precepts, that our impulse is to uphold the precepts. And when we do falter, we just falter. That's it. No big, no big deal. We falter. We notice. We can plant a new seed of resolution to do better next time, that's it. I think I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions from people on Zoom or in the Zendo. I found, um, I think it was the first story that you told, very beneficial, the one of the um, person, the first person to print um, the sutras in Japanese, um, is it reminded me of this sort of problem I've been thinking of for a while now, back from when I, I took a, a first year philosophy course last year, um, which is this thought experiment that um, effective altruists use to, to sort of justify their way of, of doing things and they, they propose that um, all, all people have the same value 
which you know, I, I would agree with that. But then they go on to say, um, if this experiment that say that you saw a person drowning in a river and you could go and save them, but if you did so, your wallet would fall out of your pocket and then float away and you would lose you know, a certain amount of money. And they say that you could have spent that money on saving a hundred people, say, in the future. Um, and so then they argue that it is actually morally better that you don't save the person that you could easily save in the river that is drowning. And I felt that there was something wrong about that. Um, you know, it felt wrong to just you know, leave a person that you could see. And I think that the, the immediacy of it is, is what matters. And so that story you told where you know, this person collected all this money and they could have spent it on saving you know, hundreds of people, you know, printing 7,000 copies of the sutras. Imagine the, the benefit that that could have. But instead they use it on something immediate. Mm. And that that was the more beneficial thing for them to do. Yeah, it is difficult, isn't it? Yes, you know, it's, it's it's tricky. It's how, but I think I think that you're right that that intuition that there is the power of what's actually happening rather than what's theoretically going to happen. And sometimes the theoretically going to happen is important to work towards. Like he did eventually print those sutras, but that immediate. Uh, is actually, it is actually happening. Yeah. Because like with that story about the wallet, well, something else might happen to the wallet before it got to be used. <laughs> and then someone would have drowned and the wallet would have got dropped and lost. <laughs> or go and raise the money again later, and, you know, um, lose the wallet and then busily try and, you know, yeah. I've not heard, I've not heard that dilemma before, that particular one. I think I would strongly agree. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, on the same topic, I I've also because I also did philosophy, same uni, and they talk about effective altruism, so I also came up against this and. Um, I think that when you're when you're sort of planning for the future this way, that there's a, a lot of attachment to 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 the self because you're sort of planning to make yourself into some kind of savior, and if you are so worried about doing the perfect thing, there's going to be a lot of clinging as well and suffering and and even though you might actually donate the money and save a lot of lives in the future at some point i think that the attitude that you're doing it with is this more prohibitive like closed down sort of from a place of fear like like i have to fix as much as possible this kind of like responsibility like the weight of the world on your shoulders i have to like sacrifice things that seem hard to sacrifice so that i can one day save everything and i feel like that just creates so much pain in the individual who's who's actually like attempting to live this way um and i feel like it it kind of shrivels that that generous part that is the initial motivation like you see suffering you want to you want to do something about it but if you if you try to like stay super super rational, so called rational about it, and like um, quantify it, I think the more you're you're quantifying suffering, the more you're stepping back from it, until it's all just this conceptual thing. Um, especially like donating money for somewhere on the other side of the world, which I'm not saying is like a bad thing, like that's a helpful thing, but if that's the main way that you choose to help people where in your personal life you're sort of just focused on making as much money as possible because this is one of the, the ideas of this philosophy is that you should do the job that makes the most money and then donate the majority of your income um you, you end up with people in jobs that are actually causing harm and that they don't enjoy um and i think i think this kind of like quantifying ethics thing really takes away from that fundamental impulse 
of just like reaching out and, and helping immediately. Um, and I know I've gotten caught in this kind of thinking a couple of times. I've sort of focused on like, for example, not buying plastics into my food. And that ended up being like really hard and expensive and complicated and like it it sort of took away from that initial impulse and it wasn't even joyful or necessarily like significantly beneficial for like one person to buy one product with less plastic in it. You know, so I think that coming back to just how it feels in your heart and in your body is so important to like checking is this is this an appropriate action like how do how am i feeling right now like mm. is this a joyful reaching out into the world or am i feeling like badgered by something am i being critical am i punishing myself somehow like for me at least that's a good metric for deciding whether something is actually going to be an appropriate response to something mm. absolutely i think Joy is a good metric. That's a nice way of putting it. Mm. That is, even even when we're doing something that is very difficult to do, like say you're working doctors without borders and dealing in a very difficult situation, you still actually can have a kind of joyfulness in the midst of that. It's a subtle, it's a subtle sense of just knowing. It's like a a right a right a right knowing that this is right somehow. Um, there's no resistance. You do it, you just want to do it. There's no resistance. You're wanting to do it. I think that's a good indication. And that's somehow our actions really do seem to be genuinely more beneficial when they come from that place. It's um, egoless and, in, and is inspired. We're just thinking, of course, we keep thinking about Thich Nhat Hanh because he... Uh, he continued on uh, recently. What he did in many ways, you know, later in his life was just giving you know talks and talking about how to breathe, and and yet the impact was so profound. He wasn't doing very sort of like big grand gestures. He didn't do these huge grand gestures of any sort. He was just so often he would just be talking about like how to breathe. <laughs> Watching him the other day, he was holding up a book. It's just kind of in breath, out breath. <laughs> you just kept doing that. It was really amazing. <laughs> so he was coming from what was really, given who he was, it was an appropriate response that he taught that way and didn't think I should do, do it some other way. All right, I did have some things to read, but we've run out of time, so we can be saved for another day. Let's finish with our closing chant. These are laws. I vow to save them. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to be counted.